Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. If you'd like to stay connected with us outside of today's digital broadcast, be sure and download our free mobile app for your smartphone. Through the app, you can watch more of Dr. Dodd's sermons, read daily devotions, access our Bible reading plan, and so much more. To download this free app, just open the App Store on your smartphone and search for Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. We hope this app is an encouragement to you and that using it will help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy this episode of Higher Aim. Let me ask you a question. Why are you here? I mean, really, why are you here? Well, it's probably because somebody somewhere in your life, maybe it was recently, or maybe it was when you were growing up, someone pointed you to Jesus and began to encourage you. Maybe it was your mom. Maybe it was your mom that was the strong one in your life spiritually. Or maybe it was your dad. I mean, uh, Maybe your dad said, Sunday, we're going to go to church. Uh, That's what we are going to do. Or or maybe it was a friend that invited you to go to church for the very first time in your life. And had they not initiated that and encouraged you uh, to do that, you you would have never shown up. Or maybe it was a good-looking girl. and you knew that she went to church there, and uh, it was a cheap date, and uh, romance evangelism happened. Or, or, or maybe, maybe it was someone in the church that uh, taught a Bible study uh, and impressed upon you the power uh, of studying and memorizing the Word of God. Or maybe it was a person who ministered to you at your greatest need. And you are really here, not because of some orator, some preacher, but rather you're here today because of the investment of someone who maybe does not know, even to this day, the power of their encouragement in your life. I, I think about a uh, little church where I grew up, um, and I, I think about Mrs. Wood. Her son was Bruce, and um, he later became a Methodist preacher, even though um, it was in a church that immersed people. But his mom made an impact on him, and he pastored for, for years and years and years and still does. And she encouraged uh, us as kids in vacation Bible school, uh, which is another way of saying VBX, uh, to read God's Word and challenged us to read the Bible through in a year. I mean, that was a powerful thing for me to hear as a fifth grader because do you know how thin the pages are and how small the print happens to be? Uh, But I'll never forget that investment. Uh, And then there was another lady, Mrs. Ferrer, and she encouraged us to memorize Scripture. I, I don't ever remember having anyone ever tell me that I needed to memorize Scripture because I wouldn't always have the Bible in my hand, and I would need to hide it in my heart and use it. And then, of course, you know the story of of the man in my life who became like my dad. Uh, Growing up in a divorced family, that man made a difference in my life, Doug Cochran. And my firstborn son carries his middle name. I mean... I probably wouldn't be here today had it not been for his investment. And then when I got in college, um, I'll never forget, I I, I went to different churches, and um, 
The only one that came to visit me in my college room was a deacon. Uh, I see his face now. He knocked on the door on a Saturday morning, and I was sleeping. Woke up, and he said, I, I saw that you came and visited last week uh, in our church, and just want to invite you to come back again and ask me how he could pray for me. I, I could never think of anyone who had ever visited me. Uh, he didn't even teach in the college department uh, in the church. He just came to encourage me. I'll never forget that. And that's why I found myself going back to that church, because that man took it upon himself to come and visit me. He made an impact in my life. Now, of course, there have been preachers over the years that, that have uh, helped me grow in the Lord and have encouraged me, but let me just tell you something. It's been God's people in my life that showed up at a moment in time that, uh, quite frankly, I needed, I needed and I'm here today because of the investment of other people in my life, church members who encouraged me, let me know that they were praying for me, always were there for me. Now, quite frankly, uh, I, I've had some not so great uh, experiences with some church members over the years. I know you have too. But the people who invested in my life, especially young, made unbelievable impact in my life. How many of you, that sounds a little bit like your story? Would you raise your hand? Man, that, that's true of the overwhelming majority of us. It's because of someone within the body of Christ that Jesus, Jesus used to help you at, because they believed in you. And that is where we are today in the study of First Peter. You see, we are trying to answer the call, and that call is to Jesus and his church. I don't mind telling you, I need Jesus. I need him more, uh, more and more every single day. But I also need the body of Christ I need people in my life who invest in my life. I, still to this day, I need the church. I need not a church building. I need the body of Christ to use their spiritual gifts to encourage me, help me, pray for me, and be there. I need somebody with skin on. And quite frankly... You are like that too. God has made us like that. And the way we answer the call to Jesus and his church is located in this passage of Scripture. Now, I've already shared quite a bit of it with you last week or two weeks ago, but today I want to catch you up and then take another step and we'll complete, Lord willing, the study of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And that's a hint for you to open the Bible. And if you don't uh, have your word today, I want you to follow along on the screen with me as we read this passage. Here's what Simon Peter writes, inspired of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Now, remember... This is written to believers. Uh, have you ever known a believer who has had a problem with malice or deceit or hypocrisy? You know, there are a lot of people who say, I, the reason I don't go to church is because of all the hypocrites there. Well, my, what I like to say is I love hypocrites in our church. I like, I, I like them in our church. Keep them off the streets. Just uh, Envy slander of every kind. Quite frankly, that can be said of all of us. Remember, Simon Peter is saying you need to get rid of that stuff. 
Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen people, and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is a powerful passage of Scripture. And last time we uh, were asking the question, and we're still trying to answer it, how do you answer the call to Jesus and his church? Let me catch you up from last time we were here and remind you what this passage is teaching us. First, it was saying, turn your back on your past. In verse 1, we talked about it just briefly when we read that first verse, and it says, get rid of all that sin in your life. God does not want you to continue to live in sin. That's the truth. You know, the, the problem is that you don't hear a lot of preaching against sin. Let me just tell you something. Sin's not in. It does more damage to our lives and to those around us. God does not want us to live a life that's addicted to the evil nature that wars in our flesh. God wants us to recognize sin in our lives and, and, and turn our back on it and choose holiness, choose godliness, and, and not the habits and the actions that we were chained to before. Turn your back on your sin. That's what the, the Scripture tells us. And then there's another thing it says, and that is turn your direction toward discipleship. Now, we spent a great deal of time like that, but, you know, the one passage, the one phrase that, uh, that speaks to all of us, it says, crave pure spiritual milk. Uh, do you have a drink that you like? I mean... Uh, I know that for many of you, coffee, you know, coffee is very, very important to you. In fact, um, some of you, um, you don't do mornings without coffee first. I, I know that's true. Or, or maybe it's a glass of iced tea or vanilla malt. I don't know what it is. Or a yogurt drink. I, I don't know. But whatever, whatever draws you uh, and encourages you, well, let me just tell you, that's what, what he's trying to say. Crave spiritual, pure spiritual milk. In other words, God wants you to long to know his word. He longs for you to long for more, not just information, but 
application of the Word of God into your life. And that's important. And that's what discipleship is. The word disciple means following one. You know, when you first took the step to follow Jesus, it began a journey in your life that would continue on. In fact, it's a journey that continues on until you meet Jesus face to face. It's going to take all of time and all eternity to get to know the eternal Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul wrote in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. You go, well, Paul, I thought you met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Yes, the Christian life begins at a moment in time where you have an encounter with Christ and you turn from sin and you place your faith in him, but it is to be an ongoing experience in your life. And there will be times where you will grow more spiritually, usually in difficult times, quite frankly and honestly, that's the truth. And because you realize that, the, that life doesn't really offer you much, but your relationship with Jesus changes you from the inside out, and you long for him. You long for a fresh movement of God in your life. You want a visitation of God, fresh and new. Not an emotional experience, but you want a, a real encounter with God. And that's exactly what he is saying. That's what discipleship is all about. It, it's to get to know Jesus better and better and better and better. And then we talked about uh, the way you answer the call is just to turn your eyes on Jesus. You, you can't help but read that passage out of First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, without realizing it's all about Jesus. I, I'm going to read it once again for you, and I want you just to focus on Jesus and listen to what the Scripture says about Jesus, how it describes Jesus. L look at this, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, you, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to, to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. The Scripture talks about Jesus being the cornerstone, the precious stone. Now, I can't tell you how many different buildings I looked at in Israel this last time and uh, found myself looking at that very same cornerstone that I showed you a picture of last time. And that's who Jesus is. He is the chief cornerstone. And this stone to us who have given our life to Christ, he's precious. But to those who choose not to respond to him, he is a stumbling stone. Either he is your precious cornerstone or he is the stone that you stumble on. One of the reasons that our founding pastor led our church decades ago to take off our denominational name on the church was simply this. We wanted people to stumble over Jesus and not a denomination. Let me just tell you something. I'm proud of our denomination that we're affiliated with and give our money for missions and, and uh, other ministries, but let me tell you something. I'm in love with Jesus. We're a Jesus church. We're about Christ and most of you come from, in fact, our church, 80% of our church comes from other denominational backgrounds. 
but our focus is on Christ. He is the cornerstone. In other words, the building doesn't get built without him as the foundation. And therefore, he is precious to us because he has changed our lives. But those who choose not to respond to him, it's going to cause them to stumble and they will fall right into hell. Either you receive Christ or you reject Christ. Now, one of the guides that I have used in Israel for now over a decade is a good friend. He's not a Christian. He's a, a Jew. He's a decorated war hero, uh, fought in the Valley of the Tears uh, up on the Golan Heights. His uh, tank that was blown up, uh, rocketed, was featured on Time magazine uh, during that, that time. And he and I have visited about Jesus. In fact, we do it all the time when I'm over there. I'll never forget, I pulled him to the side the very first time I had him while we were in the Garden of Gethsemane. I said, why don't you come with me? Let's, let's sit down and talk. What do you think about Jesus? He said, I don't know. I said, well, you know he's the Messiah, don't you? Well, he said, we don't know who the Messiah is. Well, I said, I do. And I want you to know him. And I said, you know, here you've been guiding. You know more Scripture than a lot of Christians. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross? He said, I actually do. I think historically, uh, it's true. I said, do you believe he rose from the dead? He said, I do. There's no body. Uh, I believe he rose from the dead. I said, wow, you're almost there. I said, do you believe he's the Messiah? He said, I don't know. He's, he said, you know, if, uh, if the Messiah comes during our lifetime and it's Jesus, I'll believe him. I said, the problem is your timing will be off. You need to give your life to Christ now. He said, well, we're just waiting for the Messiah. I said, you don't have to wait. And I gave him my best apologetics ever. And it was kind of like there's a veil over his face and his eyes where you can know Scripture. In fact, his son is a rabbi. He's a godly man, believes the Word of God. In fact, he, you know what he told me last time, this uh, last week? He said, the only difference between you and me is this. We both believe the Bible, all of it. And uh, he said, you love the Old Testament. I said, I do. And I said, and you know a lot of the New Testament. He said, I do. And he said, but the only difference between the two of us is that you believe Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm not so sure. I said, my prayer is that one day you will be sure. I said, if you ever receive Christ, it's not going to change you from being a Jew. You will not lose your Jewishness. Jesus was a Jew. Do you understand? He went, I get that. But here's the deal. Someone can believe all the facts about Jesus, give mental ascension to what the Scripture says, but unless they turn from sin and place their faith in Jesus as their only hope, unless they place their faith in what Jesus did for them on the cross and shed his perfect, innocent blood for us, they will not become a follower of Jesus. And, and they're headed to hell. I don't care how religious they are. You go, that doesn't seem fair. Well, I didn't make the rules. And you didn't either. And it's not our job to say how we like it or not. But here's what the Scripture says. He's the cornerstone. And we who believe in him, man, he's precious to us. But for those who do not believe in him, he becomes the very stone on which people will stumble. 
That's what the scripture says. Do you understand the difference? This is not about church. This is about a relationship with Jesus. And you and I are, are called to a deeper walk, which is discipleship, to really know Christ, who is the foundation stone. Let me give you another thing. This is brand new. Uh, you, you were kind of slow today, and that's why I had to take a little bit more time. But there's another thing I want to share with you from this passage, and that is if you're going to answer the call to Jesus and his church, you will have to turn your mind on your position. What you think about you, how you see yourself is very, very important. I'd love to read this scripture verse again, but I'm not going to because of time. But we first read it a second time, because I wanted you to focus in on Jesus. But if you read that same passage, I want you to think about, and I'm going to pull the words out today, that it says about you, for you to focus on who you are is very, very important. Many of us, we focus on who we're not. And we, we, we shame ourselves and we guilt ourselves trying to think that, well, that'll help us, and it doesn't. God wants us to focus on our position. Let me just tell you who the Scripture and what the Scripture says about who you are, you who follow Christ. First of all, it says you are living stones. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but you are living stones. Not stones that are living, that are separate from each other, but you're part of this, this building. You're living and breathing. You are important to the house of God, and you are built on the cornerstone, and you are living. You're not dead. There, there is, there's life in you. You're living and you're breathing, and God is using you to build his house. You're a living stone. I know if you said that to your wife, I'm a living stone, she'd probably say, well, you're more stone than living. But the real truth is that's the analogy here, that you are a stone. And then you are a spiritual house, the Scripture says. You're built on the rock together with each other, built on him. That's why I started this message today talking to you about the people that have made a difference in my life. Do you realize how much a di difference you make in other people's lives? And that's why you need to be connected to Jesus and his church. His church is made up of different people who are living and breathing, who have been changed by God and are being used by God to build a spiritual house and the Bible says you are chosen. In other words, God picked you to be on his team. He gave you his uniform. He's put you on first string. You have been chosen by him. Uh, yesterday, my, my, one of my youngest grandsons, uh, Luca, who lives in Florida, uh, he turned seven, uh, <clears throat> and he had a soccer game. And uh, his team won four to nothing. He scored all four goals. He's an aggressive little boy, you know. And he, I mean, I'm proud of him. And I, I, I love him not only because he's my grandson, but he likes to fish. That boy will stay on a boat all day long and never complain. Uh, and he's, he's living, he's breathing, he's active. And I want you to see that He's my grandson, and of all the grandsons I could ever have, I'd choose him. I want you to see that God has chosen you. He's picked you. He's got a plan for you. You're chosen. You are chosen. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel real special, that of all the people in the world, God could have chosen. He chose me. He chose you. We are are chosen. We ought to be celebrating that we have been chosen. Don't worry about who hasn't been chosen. That's not, that's way above your pay grade and mine too. But rather we need to celebrate that God chose us 
that our eyes are open and we turn to Christ and we are connected with other people. In fact, the Bible says another thing, that you are a holy priesthood. Oh, now that doesn't mean you have a white collar here, but rather all believers are considered in the priesthood. In other words, you know what a priest does? They represent God to others. And that's exactly what you and I do. They not only represent the people to God being intercessors, but we also represent God to other people. And part of what we do, we are offering sacrifices. Your life is to be a a living sacrifice, the the Scripture says. In other words, the way you live, the way you talk, the way you do your life, well, it's an offering to God, and it's an ongoing offering. You know, a priest in some religions, they don't get married. You know why? Because their only love is to be Jesus. Now, thank the Lord for marriage, uh, and I think that that is the normal thing, but the whole focus is, in the Old Testament, priests were married, but it doesn't make a difference if you're married or you're single. Your main love and service ought to be to Jesus. That's what it's about. Because guess what? When we go to heaven, there's no marriage. Better enjoy it now. And maybe marriage will make you ready for heaven soon. <laughs> but I want you to know that God wants you to see yourself as serving him and honoring him. Set apart for him. That's who you are. You need to focus on that. And the Bible says, together we are a holy nation. There is nothing more powerful than the church of God. We've been set apart. We're a different nation. In other words, our citizenship is in heaven. We are to operate under a different flag. Do you understand that? I I am proud to be an American. I really am. But let me tell you something, I am more proud to be a follower of Jesus than anything else because that citizenship I have and you have who have given your life to Christ, you are considered a holy nation. That's what the Scripture says. You need to realize who you are. And we are also God's special possession with purpose. That's what Scripture says here in this passage. In other words, we're his special possession possession with purpose to give him praise and declare that he has called us from darkness into light. Now, knowing all of that, and if you focus on who you are, that will give you the healthy self-image that you need. It will give you a life of purpose. So, stop acting and stop living like you're clueless. The Scripture wants you to know who you are. With all the rights and privileges, it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if you'll focus in on who you are, then you will become someone who lives that out. There's one more thing I want to share with you, and that is simply this. Turn your life inside out. Verse 11 and 12 says that. It says that we are dear friends, sojourners, pilgrims. We live differently as believers, followers of Christ. You know why? Because we are different. We have a relationship with God the Father because of Jesus. And therefore, we're just passing through. That's what a sojourner is, one who's on a journey, one who is to live now effectively realizing we're not part of this system. We have a different agenda. We have a different purpose. We have a different place, and we have a different eternity waiting for us because we are followers of the cornerstone, Jesus. So therefore, the Scripture is saying, because you're different, deal on the inside with your sin. The word picture in the Greek language is that of a a battle campaign that is supposed to be warred ongoingly. 
In other words, wage war was sin, not once for all, but all the time. As long as you're in this skin suit, you're going to have a battle with sin. Can I have an amen on that one? That's the truth. You're going to be drawn toward the dark because that sin nature that has been broken is still wagging and beckoning you to grab hold of it. And that, there needs to be an ongoing war with the sin nature in your life and understand who the real enemy is. And then turn your life inside out and focus in on your outside. In other words, deal with your witness. You see, moral failures are real, but our God does forgive. I mean, he really does. God forgives. But you and I still, in the midst of that, need to choose to be sensitive to our witness. And though your, your life may be misunderstood or maligned, criticized, ridiculed. In fact, uh, you know one of the things they used to say about the believers in the first century? They were cannibals. Did you know that? That they practice communion with the body and blood of Christ. And one of the things was that they were cannibals. That'd scare you from going to church. <laughs> you may end up as main course with that. And that's exactly what that was describing. You and I are to live differently even when people malign us and say things that are not true about us. You see the picture here? Your life makes a difference. I thank the Lord for Doug Cochran, Mrs. Wood, Mrs. Ferrer, different pastors over the years in my life because they made an impact in my life because they were living out of who they were in Jesus, and they just sloshed all over me. And I got to tell you, I thank the Lord for those living stones that I had a chance to brush up against for a brief moment in time. You are a living stone. Oh, answer the call to Jesus and his church, and watch what he will do to build you and build us, because that's what God does. He's in the building business. Thanks for watching Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Visit higheraim.org for more free resources. There, you can access our daily devotions, sign up for our monthly teaching letter, even download the Higher Aim app, and so much more. Just go to higheraim.org to get started.